talking about uh, privacy, and let me know if I'm getting this too close to my mouth, because usually I don't speak in a microphone. Today we're going to talk about some of my more hardcore writing. We're going to talk about two books, Fake ID by Mail and Modem, and The ID Forger. Definitely not favorites on the FBI reading list. Okay? Now, two things i got to tell you. We have sold out of this book, but we will have more of it here tomorrow. And I really encourage you guys to get a copy of this book, because I need the royalties. <laughs> we got plenty of this one left out there. When I'm done, I urge you, I besiege you, beseech you to please besiege the Lumpanics table and get your books now. In any case, let's get started on fake ID and ID forging. As you know, I have written a lot of books about how to create a new identity uh, from the ground up uh, in various permutations. Generally, during that process of new identity creation, at some point you'll need to use a fake ID document. Or you may just want a fake ID document for privacy reasons, and we'll get into a number of reasons why you may want them. Of course, there are a lot of sites now on the internet, as the internet has grown as a medium of doing business, that purport to offer high quality documents. Well, as many of you know who have tried to buy these documents, that many of these sites are scams who take you a hundred bucks or more and you never hear from them. And it's not exactly like you can call up your local police department and say, hey, Sheriff Bob, I didn't get my fake ID, you know? What can you do about it? And the guy at the FBI would say, well, why don't you come on down to our office? We'd be more than happy to help you out. Okay? So, here's two things. One, go to my website, privacypower.com. I have a page on there about fake ID sites. If I find out an ID site is legitimate, I will post it on my site and say that I've checked them out. In fact, I was hoping to tell you I would have know of a new source for high quality fake IDs at the conference. I was contacted last week. I gave the guy my email address. I told him to email me his URL and other info. Guy never got back to me. I called him a couple of times, so it probably was a scam. I will not recommend the site on a recommend a fake ID vendor in, at my website or in the book unless I personally have verified that they will, one, do the quality of work they say they'll do, and number two, that they will ship their money. First, let me tell you, there's a bunch of websites that offer, to purport to offer high quality fake IDs. They're all run by the same guy. One of them is called ProMaster ID. There's fakeid.org, a bunch of these places. It's a bunch of guys in uh, Saskatchewan. What they do is they set up uh, domains, uh, then they get mail drops, they take all their customers' money, then when the heat gets too bad at that one, they have another one set up, and then they start there. The scans at their sites look really good because what they do is they get a copy of the ID checking guide and simply put those scans up on their site. So do not fall for these guys, okay? Unfortunately, probably a quarter of the websites purporting to offer high quality fake ID on the internet are these guys. Don't give them any more of your hard-earned money. These guys are already millionaires from all the people they've stolen money from. Okay, those are my two caveats. Now let's get to the, the big stuff here. First of all, can you legally sell, make, and use fake ID? Well, the answer is yes and no. Prior to 1983 in the United States, there were basically no, there was no federal regulation of fake ID. It's always been a crime to counterfeit federal documents like a military ID, a passport, currency, stuff like that. But there was no specific laws at the federal level that dealt with the production, the manufacture, and the use of fake ID. Prior to 1983, there were all sorts of vendors across the United States who would sell anything you wanted to buy. You wanted a driver's license, you could buy it. You wanted a birth certificate, you could buy it. And it was good stuff for the quality of the technology at the time. 
And the only possible problems these vendors could have was in their own state. So usually what they would do is if the vendor was located in New York, he wouldn't sell a New York driver's license and he wouldn't sell it to anybody who actually lived in New York. That meant he, his customers, they couldn't, there was no legal way for him to be held liable because it wasn't even illegal to use the mails to ship the fake ID. When they started to try to harass him on that, then they would use FedEx or UPS. Well, that all changed because of two things. In the mid-70s, Congress had a big uh, to-do on the false uh, use of false identification in the United States. There was a huge government report, blah, blah, blah. Well, to make a long story short, that government report, seven years later, created the impetus that created the first laws at the federal level regulating the production, sale, use, and transfer of fake ID. And it was the False Identification Control Act of 1982, which went into effect January 1 of 1983. In a nutshell, now, in this book, Fake ID by Mail and Modem, and let me flack it for you again. See? Nice bookie. In any case, in the front of this book, I reprint the law. But in a nutshell, here's what the law says. That should do two things. One, you can make any kind of document you want to make, that's, even if it's an exact duplicate of a federal or state ID, if there's a disclaimer in 10-point type across it that says, not a federal document. Well. Let me tell you how that has developed. One time I ordered a document from a vendor. They were selling Colorado driver's licenses. This is a few years ago. Wonderful license. But in the ad, they neglected to tell you that, oh, when you get this document, underneath the laminate will be not a government document. And it's like, well, and I sent it back to them saying, what good is this going to do me? If I go try to use this at a bank or whatever, they're going to look at it and say, but it says not a government document. You know, so it was useless. The point of it is, they have to put the disclaimer on it. If you put the disclaimer on, you can make anything that you want to make. The second thing that the law allows you to do is that if a document doesn't have a birth date on it, essentially, it's unregulated. If you notice, a lot of the, what I call the lower level types of IDs these places say, the kind that say that you're a bounty hunter, a photographer, a private investigator, you notice none of them generally have birth dates of the holder on them. Why do you think that's the case? Because if you don't have a birth date on it, it's not considered to be an identification document as per the law. So the other part of the law says you can make anything that you want to make if you leave a birth date off of it. And it's not an ex a duplicate of something that exists. So this is where the law stands. Now, what's happened is a lot of vendors now have realized, hey, this is the law, they've consulted with lawyers, and now they have set up businesses selling documents that conform to this law. So here's my first warning to you about fake ID by mail and modem. If you consult with a vendor and his documents don't have this disclaimer, I can guarantee you that in a matter of time, he's going to be busted by either the FBI or the Secret Service. You have to use the disclaimers. If you don't, you will be busted, okay, if you're in the United States. Now, let's talk about IDs from other countries if the vendor is outside the United States. Then the law of that country is the operational law. To give an example, it is illegal to go to a copy machine and make a copy of a U.S. dollar bill here in the United States. It is not illegal to go and make a photocopy of a Canadian dollar bill here in the United States because a Canadian dollar bill is not, or a five dollar bill, since there aren't any ones and twos left in Canada anymore, as any of the Canadians here know, it, that is not legal tender in this country. It's not legally money in this country. It's colored paper in this country. So the law that governs the manufacture, sale, and transfer of fake ID in another country is that country's laws. If that country's laws say, hey, if they say it's a novelty and they put novelty on it, then we don't not interested in it, then you can safely order that from that country because that country's authorities would have to prosecute the seller of the document. 
What is a novelty? Because you see this a lot. A novelty means toy. Essentially, I mean, what is a toy? If I said to you, define a toy. Well, you know, we all have an idea of what a toy is, but it's kind of hard to say exactly what it is. Essentially, when you say something is a novelty document, you're saying, I made a toy in the form of a driver's license. Okay? That's what novelty means. So, for example, fake ID sellers in Canada, under Canadian law, if it's clearly labeled a novelty document, they can sell them. Now, if most of their customers are in the United States, the problem is what happens when it goes across the, the border and U.S. Customs would open the package? Well, there's two things. First of all, smart sellers of documents know that you send things via first-class mail because, in general, Customs can only open a first-class letter if they have probable cause to open it. They just don't open it at random. However, packages can, or mail that's sent other than first-class can be opened for any reason at any time. So generally, these the sellers of these documents will send them via first-class mail. The other thing that they will do is that the document will have a sticker on it that will say novelty and the outer envelope there won't be anything that won't say fake ID company of British Columbia. Okay? Hey, you think that's, uh, that sounds stupid, but I have ordered stuff when you get it, now it's crappy, and it's got on there photo, you know, ID fraud place, you know, 54 Granville Street, Vancouver, BC. Gee, it's like, hmm. That's probable cause for the customs guy to open it. But the point is, if it says novelty, it's legal. But here's what will happen. They'll open it and go, oh, well, let's write down this guy's name and address. Anything else you get that comes from out of the country, then they might open it. And you get, and then you come back from that weekend trip to Toronto or Vancouver. It's like, damn, why did they send us in for secondary inspection? Well, gee, because, hmm, that fake ID you ordered from the ID scammers up in Toronto or Vancouver. That's why. So these are the operation, operative laws that govern the manufacture, sale, and transfer of fake ID. Finally, there can be state laws. That's where you have to be real careful. For example, Florida recently concluded an enforcement program of fake ID because college students were buying high-quality fake IDs from a vendor now that shut down and using it for underage drinking. So the Florida Alcohol and Beverage Commission started really going after uh, this guy and they threatened to charge him under a Florida state law. So you have to be cognizant of the fact that since a few cases there are state laws that govern this. But in general, the federal law is the operative law, especially if a vendor says, well, I'll only sell my wares to someone located in another state than the state that I'm in. So, like I said, step one is to always make sure that the vendor, if he is offering for sale documents that are finished documents that do not have the disclaimer, then he's going to be shut down and your name and address might get onto an investigative list. I say stay clear of that, okay? Now, as far as the disclaimer though, nobody says, it says it has to be on there, but nobody says it has to be on there in indelible ink. Nobody says you can't put it on there in a way that you can take it off. One seller of go-kart driver's licenses, go-kart driver's licenses, he puts a disclaimer on, but the disclaimer and the word go-kart are above the body of the rest of the document. So hmm, it's like, oh, I see, cut along the perforated line, add photo, seal and laminate, and miraculously the go-kart has disappeared, and now it's just a driver's license. Then, now, if he doesn't, as long as the vendor doesn't tell you to do that, it's legal. Okay? Or there's sellers, and I show them in the book, who sell what we call the unsocial security card. The unsocial security card. Okay? Did you hear that? All right? Now, so nobody said, well, wait a minute, is there any way I might be able to remove the un? One vendor puts the U in on a flap a little bit above the rest of the word social. And it's like, oh, snip, snip. Voila, right? Hey, a lot of you have green cards, the so-called resident alien card. Well, how'd you like to be the president alien? 
Okay. You get my drift here? Because those are clearly novelties, it's not illegal to make a president alien card. Maybe the guy's from Mars. You're the president of Mars, okay? That's not illegal. It's not illegal to make an unsocial security card. Maybe the guy's just in bad mood all the time. That's not illegal. I don't even have to put a disclaimer on that. And of course, this drives INS and these, the FBI and you name the, you put the three letters together, it drives them nuts because these are totally legal. They don't even have to worry. So if you see a president alien card or an unsocial security card or a go-kart driver's license, then I say that's a good document to buy. Now, the other reason those documents can be good, and I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes when I talk about ID forging, is that president alien card well, you know what? He sells it to you blank. And you know what? It's a pretty good card because you could put that card in your computer and in Photoshop, miraculously, you go from being the president alien to being a resident alien. And I'll tell you something. Fake green card is very good. You know why? Because the only people who can verify that document is INS. Most state DMVs can't. Uh, most other government agencies, they're taught if the document looks to be authentic, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, then you accept the document. So, for somebody who's trying to create a new identity, the use of one of these store-bought, so to speak, fake green cards can be an ideal way to penetrate the system because the only people who can verify it are INS. But that brings us to another point of the use of fake ID. You never use a fake ID when it could be in a, where you could be in a position where the person you're supplying it to can verify it. You never do. In other words, a fake driver's license with one exception, which I'll talk about later, is good for everything except driving a car. A fake green card is good for everything except crossing the border. Because you give that fake resident alien card to the border inspector when you're coming back from Vancouver or Tijuana, and he puts it in the computer, he's going to have a nice big smile for you and say, uh, Mr. Jones, could you please step inside for a few minutes? And guess what? You're not going to step outside for a couple of years. Okay? So, let's keep that in mind. You have, to, you have to know when and where you can use your fake IDs. Generally, the stated purpose of the fake ID, driver's license to drive a car, is exactly what you cannot use it for. Okay? Now, we'll talk about the one exception where a high-quality fake driver's license can be used to drive a car. It's what we call ghosting. And this happened to a man in Portland, Oregon, I guess about a year and a half, two years ago. He was a bus driver for their transit system. He's driving his bus, dumb diddy dum you know, being the wage slave that we all are. And he gets, the bus gets pulled over. He's like, damn, who are the cops after? You know, like four cops pulling them over. It's like, yeah, holy smokes, right? And it's like, oh no, we don't want one of your passengers. We want you, buddy. He's like, what you talking about? He said, well, you know what? You never showed up for that DUI trial down in Florida. You jumped bail, so we're taking your ass to jail, and you're going back to Florida, and boy, I wouldn't want to be you. And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? I've never even been to Florida. I'm a damn bus driver in Portland, Oregon, for God's sake. Right? Hey, I've been to Portland. It's not a bad town. Okay? Now, listen. So what happens? The guy goes to jail, and he's telling the cops, no, no. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we've heard it all before, blah, blah, blah. Now, remember, when you're wanted on, to be extradited someplace, the state doesn't give you a lawyer. They say, hey, we just hold you. We send you back. You take it up with the people there. Well, he's, you know, hooting and hollering it. No, I am not this guy, whatever. Finally, he, he hires an attorney. The attorney gets the fingerprints sent, all that stuff. It's not the guy. Here's what happened. A very enterprising fellow said, hey, I need a driver's license, one that if I get pulled over, it'll verify. So he said, I know. I'll go buy the CD-ROM, which I believe the state of Oregon still sells, of all their license holders. So he buys the Oregon DMV database. See, I'm talking about privacy yesterday, see? I told you, your DMV is the greatest seller of your privacy in anybody. So the guy went through, and it's like, okay, I'm a black male, 5'11", stocky build, medium complected. There's 10 people in this room who, in general terms, look like I do. 
So I could go search the Oregon database, find a license holder whose general identifiers are the same. Now I've got that person's license number, their name, the expiration date of the license, and their general physical description. I then go buy or make a high quality forgery of that Oregon DL, but I put those identifiers on it. If I get pulled over any place in this country, the cop will run the license and bingo, it comes back that it's valid. I'm not John Q. Newman, I'm Joe Smith from Portland. Well, that's exactly what happened to this guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> he said, let's hope you don't pick the wrong guy who's wanted for murder. Wait, hang on a sec. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, real quick, and it's very serious. There's some people out there, and I'm hoping some, one of their friends is in the audience, uh, who seem to think that IRC is real life. Okay, threatening the staff will not be tolerated. Threatening to kill someone will not be tolerated. Threatening to kick someone's ass will not be tolerated. You will be arrested. We are currently looking for them. If you see them before we do, would you please suggest that they not come back? That's absolutely unacceptable. That's childish and ridiculous. And I'm ashamed that you would let this happen. So going forward, once again, please act like adults. I'm sorry. In any case, back where we were. So the point is, is that by buying the database of real license holders, he was able to then use a high quality forgery that actually was the license of a real individual. And I might add, this is a danger that all of us could face because if you've got a license from almost any state in this country, then they sell off your driving record to anybody who wants to buy it. In fact, many of them sell the whole database off in mass to anybody who wants to buy it. The point is, if you're in the use, if you're on the other end where you want to create a fake ID that you can drive under, this is a step you can take. First, go get a state's database of drivers, or you could be a clerk at a, at a busy store, heck, at a hotel, right? You need a driver's license because yours is toast. When the people check in, they show ID, you find somebody whose general physical description, and that's all it has to be, is similar then boom, you write that information down, then you don't even have to buy his driving record. You could then go put that data onto your high quality counterfeit and boom, you're driving and styling, okay? It's kind of like making a counterfeit credit card, except in this case, what you're stealing is his ability to drive a car, not his ability to charge merchandise. So this is the one way that you can actually use a fake ID that will pass a that will pass a credit that will pass a computer check. Now let's talk about other reasons that somebody may want to use a fake uh, ID. I've written a piece that's in the current catalog supplement that we've got at the table at Loom Panics, and we've also reprinted the article. It's called "The Tyranny of the Check Approval Services: The Scarlet Letter of the New Millennium." At my website, of course, you guys know I offer a consulting service for people that have identity, credit, and other similar problems. I get hundreds of inquiries over the course of every few months about I can't open a bank account any place in the United States because of what happened and they always call check systems or telecheck and you know it was 10 years ago or whatever. This is where the ability to have a high quality fake ID can help because let's talk a bit about this. When you open up a bank account, a deposit account, we're not talking about credit in the traditional sense, but just a deposit account, generally the bank either calls or now most of the time it's done online, they will check with telecheck, with telecheck or check systems and give them your name and license number or name and SSN. Now, if it comes back that there's negative data in their files, they say, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, but well, we just don't like your kind. Of course, they won't say it that way. They'll just say, we really don't want your money. 
And you're like, well, what the hell is going on? Blah, blah, blah. Well, it's because you have the new scarlet letter of the new millennium, which is check approval services. These, any time now, and beware of this, boy, you can have an account closed, even, you know, for, because it was overdrawn for, 50, for 30 days or more for 50 bucks. In the old days, it was just, you could pay it off eventually, and then you could open new accounts. Well, now, they've said, we're basically like credit bureaus. We're going to keep this on file for seven years, or even longer. So even if you pay it off, you may still not be able to open a new bank account. And of course, the banks say to you, well, it's not us. It's check systems. Okay? You know, that's like the murderer saying, well, it wasn't me. It was the gun. You know? So... Getting a new driver's license, can uh, a high-quality fake driver's license or a social security card can be a solution to the banking problem because it can allow you to immediately go open a new bank account. It's to understand what they do and is not verified. The bank isn't actually verifying your license is real and been issued. What they're verifying is that the number is not in the database, the negative database of people that have had accounts closed for overdraft abuse. That's what they're verifying. Same way with the SSN. They're not verifying that your credit is good. What they're verifying is that that number has not been associated with someone who has abused check writing or savings account privileges and had an account closed because of overdraft abuse. Understanding that, for example, frequently my clients will say, okay, I want to open a bank, a new bank account, but like, what do I pick for the number on the driver's license or whatever? Well, what I say is pick a state that uses an SSN for the license number, then go look up and see what current SSNs are being issued because they'll belong to just people that aren't in the banking system yet. Use that SSN and say that's your license number. And say your license is from Hawaii, you know, which is a state that uses the SSN as your license number. Guess what? They apply online and boom, the computer comes back saying, welcome to big, ugly internet bank. Please send your initial deposit. Blah, blah, blah. They're back in the banking system. That's one place a fake ID can help. The other place where f fake ID, high quality fake ID can help is you might set up a new credit history uh, using the classic techniques of identity creation, which I talk about in my book, Reborn with Credit and Credit Power. The problem is now you've got a fistful of credit cards, but they're in a name that you have no ID in. Okay? This is where a high quality fake ID can be helpful because now you have an ID to match the credit cards that you have now created under a new identity. So there can be a, a second ID, a high quality fake ID can also be used to allow you, if you just want to create a second bank account in a different name for privacy reasons, it can allow you to do so. So there could be many reasons that you actually want to get uh, a fake ID. So the thing of it is, is that this is, like I said, we have to be, what you have to be aware of. Now, let's talk about things like mail order birth certificates. You can order birth certificates by mail. There are a few places that sell them. Here's the caveat. If it's going to be a place that's not going to be shut down, they're not going to be state-issued birth certificates. They're going to be hospital birth certificates. Anybody can make a hospital birth certificate because it's not a government document that we're duplicating. So if I want to cre create hospital birth certificates or church baptismal certificates, I can make a high quality document. I can make anything I want to and sell that because they're not purporting to be from a government agency. Well, don't think our friends in the ID accepting business haven't realized that. Read the application for a U.S. passport. It says state, county, or city issued birth certificate. Most DMVs now, if you read the literature carefully, it will say a U.S. or county issued birth certificate. A few places will still accept hospital birth records, but the general tendency has been not to. Why, you might be curious, why did it get so bad like this? Well, you can thank the little town of Rio Rico, Texas. Back in 1970, they readjusted the border between the United States and Mexico. And to make a long story short, 
Rio Rico, which had previously been in Mexico, is now in Texas, which meant that anybody who had ever been born in Rio Rico back to whenever Texas entered the Union was technically an American citizen. Well, this is a little tiny village of maybe as many people in that section of the room. Mysteriously, eight to 10,000 people applied for U.S. passports from Rio Rico. It was rather an amazing occurrence. I mean, it's like, wow, somebody finally at the passport agency in Houston noticed that, my God, wait a minute, I thought this was just a little town of one borough and a gas station. Well, no, it was like 10,000 people, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm from Rio Rico. See, here's my birth certificate from the, you know, clinic to whatever. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. Well, to make a long story short, the U.S. passport office is now the most adept agency at detecting fake ID, okay? You don't you go for a passport, even if you've made a new identity and it's hardened, unless you have taken all the steps, because if anybody will ferret you out, it will be the U.S. passport office. However, having said that, it's possible to get around them. Look, the watchwords of agencies that accept documents, here's what you have to understand. Let's say I know that you, sir, are going to the DMV under the new identity, because you look like the kind that might need a new identity, under the new identity that you have set up to, uh, to start over. Because you've got 10 kids, you're tired of supporting them, and whatever. Okay? <laughs> hey, I know about this guy, trust me. But so in any case, <laughs> in any case, you and I both know you're up to no good. Right? So when you walk in there, I know you're up to no good, you know you're up to no good, but what you've got to understand is the clerks in that office don't know he's up to no good. You go to a DMV on any given day, and I challenge you to do this, you go and just stand around and you watch. The employees are underpaid, overfed, and bored as hell. It's the same thing. Right? So you see a birth certificate, is this where you live, is this your current address, have you ever had a license before, blah, 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 blah. All right, I'm going to lunch. And then after lunch, is this a birth certificate? Well, uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay? It's the same damn thing. So, the point I'm making here is, of the thousand people they see that day, those people, 99.999% of them are there on legitimate business. They're not crooks. They're not particularly looking for crooks. So, if you go in there, with everything they say they have to have unless you give them a reason to suspect that the documents you're showing them are not real, they're going to treat you as if you are any other customer. So it's two things. One, understand that. You will bring the suspicion on yourself based on how you act. If they ask you what your name is and you go, uh, John, uh, I mean, Trent, I mean, uh, whatever, that's not a good sign. Okay? Or if they say, can you sign your name here, sir? And you're like, uh, uh, oh, 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 there we go. That's not a good sign. That sets off the warning bells because they're given some rudimentary training to tell them if the applicant is unsure when asked his, to state his full name, this may be an indication of identity fraud. I know, I've seen their training tape. Okay? You know, or... You know, if the name on the do documents the applicant presents does not match the name that he gives you, this could be a sign of identity fraud. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's like saying, if the man, while standing in line at the bank, pulls a gun up with a note, this could be an indication you're being robbed. I mean, you know, it's very rudimentary. So the point is, is know your story, who you're saying you are, and who you're going to be, so that when you go in there, you're not sweating, you're not dripping wet, your hands aren't shaking, okay? If you know this, that you will bring the suspicion on yourself. So if you understand that, guess what? They're not thinking everybody in here is a criminal. When, that, when my number comes up, they're not thinking criminal, 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 criminal. You are. They're not, okay? Now, part two. Never underestimate their intelligence. This is the other thing. Although they are bored, underpaid, and overfed, they are not totally stupid because they've got a damn good retirement plan, probably better than most of us in here, okay? 
So the point of it is, they're working that job because they want that job, even though it's boring as hell. They don't ever get laid off. I don't know if you notice that. In any case, the point of it is, so don't go in there with documents you know your grandmother wouldn't believe. Okay? I mean, I have seen this happen. It's like, oh, well, I'll go in here with this. And it's like, well, sir, I don't understand. It looks like your birth certificate was filled out in pencil. Uh, well, sir, I don't know. If according to this, you were born in 1947, but your mother was born in 1960. That makes no sense, sir. I mean, hey, I have seen and heard it all. That's the guy who they're like, oh, could you please wait here? And the next time he opens a door, it's with bars on it, and five years later, he's free again, okay? Never underestimate their intelligence. Here's the thing. When you're using, you know what kind of fake ID you can and can't use. You can use what I call foundation documents. Foundation documents are the documents that allow us to get the ID we use on an operational basis, on a daily basis in the United States. For example, a foundation document is a birth certificate, a baptismal certificate, a social security card can be considered to be a foundation document, a college transcript. Those are foundation documents. High quality forgeries of foundation documents will almost always allow you to penetrate the identification system and get real things like licenses, passports, that kind of stuff. You never ever use a fake state ID card or driver's license to, at a DMV because they can verify its issuance on the computer. So foundation documents are fine to use to, as forgeries to build real identity documents. Now, there may be a time between when you're creating a new identity and leaving the old one where you need to use, like I say, a fake, like a fake driver's license to open a bank account because then that will give you a credit card, an ATM debit card on that account. That's now a piece of real ID that will verify. The goal is to use the fake ID in a gradual process to migrate into a new identity where all of the documents are real. So let me conclude the first part of this on the fake ID by mail and modem by saying that's the kind of thing I cover in this book. Other things I cover in this book are like, okay, there's some good cards to use. Like, for example, you picked out a new name and birth date for yourself. You can buy a press card from a real press service. Nobody needs, no, it's not Newsweek, no. But the point is, it'll actually verify. They can actually call or write the press service, and it'll verify. It's okay. You can use some of the techniques talked about in here. There's a company that will custom make high-quality PVC corporate ID cards for you. There's no reason, and you guys, as computer literate as you are, you set up a corporate website, address, telephone numbers, you make your own ID cards to go with it. That's now a supportive form of ID. Here's the thing to know when dealing with government agencies. Find out what they'll take. In general, government agencies operate on two systems. Either they'll say, we require this document and this document, or some of them say, we operate on an ID point system where you have to have 70 ID points and that's acceptable for us to issue you what you want. And then there might be a whole bunch of different documents they take, like in Ohio, oh my God, to get a license, man, they'll take a college transcript, they'll take this, they'll take that, blah, 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 I mean, it's like this long. And they think this makes their system more secure. In reality, it makes it easier to penetrate because they're taking so many different kinds of things that there's no way that their people can know what all of those things look like at any given time. So if you go in there with high quality forgery, you probably walk out with what you want. And that brings us to the second thing that I wanted to talk about, which is the ID forger. There was a, well, I saw that there was a lack of a book that could teach somebody who doesn't know a whole lot about computers, such as myself, hey, I want to make a birth certificate or a transcript or whatever that is so good I can take it to a DMV or the passport office and it will pass scrutiny. That's what this book is about. This book primarily is about how to make those kind of foundation documents. First, I'll talk about the birth certificate because that's a critical document to have. 
Okay, here's the deal on birth certificates. In the United States, there's 50 states and, what, about six territories. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, you know, got it. Are there any more? Heck, I don't know. That lets you see what I know. In any case, in this country, there are 7,000 offices that can issue birth records at the government level. In fact, we, there's always, and here's how it breaks down, in every state there is the State Central Vital Statistics Bureau. That state acts as a collating center where all counties forward birth records after somebody is born and the birth is registered in a county to that agency. So you can always get a copy of a birth certificate for anyone anywhere in that state from the State Central Vital Statistics Bureau. In most states, the county registrar also issues birth certificates to, for people who were born in that county. So at a minimum, most people can get their birth certificate at two different locations, and they will look different very frequently. The, usually a state, a certificate from the state, but sometimes it's the reverse of this, would be on much more ornate paper with more security features, whatever. Frequently the certificate from the county would just be a white sheet of paper, even a half size sheet of paper, and that kind of thing. Finally, many cities like Cincinnati, a few others, New York City, still issue, have city registrars where anybody born in the city limits of that particular city can get their certificate from the city health department. So those are the three different agencies in the United States that issue certificates. For those of you in Canada, Canada has had a centralized birth certificate issuance process for f almost 50 years. In Canada, all certificates are issued by the provincial government. And then Quebec, that started in 1994. Up to that time in Quebec and New Brunswick, birth certificates were primarily registered by the Catholic Church. And that's why baptismal records are still accepted if you were born in one of those provinces of Canada as proof of birth. But Canada, in the main now, it's a centralized birth certificate issuance process. All Canadian birth certificates look essentially the same except minor variations and that was by design. But the United States is a completely different situation. So let's say you decide, I want to make a fake birth certificate. Well, once again, in this business, the devil is in the details. I do not know how many times I have told clients who have paid me much money to advise them this. I'm just checking the time here. I have quite client, told clients who have paid me much money this. And I'll talk about the details on the birth certificate. Those numbers on the birth certificate aren't just mumbo jumbo, okay? They really aren't. There's a numbering sequence, and let me talk about how that is decided. Every 10 years, a vital statistics working group meets in this country, and they decide this is what we would like to see most countries' birth certificates, most states' birth certificates look like. They have, the reason you'll notice, if you talk to people and say, hey, can I see your birth certificate, blah, 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 a lot of them, maybe over half of them, will have the same general outlook. And this is what's called the U.S. Standard Certificate of Birth. This is what a blank U.S. Standard Certificate of Birth looks like here in the book. This book is available over at the Loom Panics table in case you don't see it here. This is a standard U.S. Standard blank birth certificate body. If the federal government could have its way, all states would use this as the body copy for their birth certificate. Now, not all states do, but most use this or a very close variation. There's certain information that is on all of them. The numbering is at the same place on all of them, that kind of stuff. So, step one, if you're going to forge a birth certificate, go with the flow. Okay? Think about it. I'm, I'm Mr. Snoopy DMV clerk. What do I see hundreds of every week? This. So don't go in there with a birth certificate that looks much different. Go in with one that looks like this. Then you look like you're everybody else. Remember the whole point of the ID changing business is to blend in. This is not for iconoclast. The whole point is, is to blend in, get what you want, then go home and laugh at those assholes because guess what? Your computer says I'm James Bond, okay? But to get there, you got to go with the flow. This lets you go with the flow, okay? That's number one. 
So, know what the document is that's most popular looks like. Make sure your document looks pretty much like it. Okay? Now, the next thing is the numbers on birth certificates. There's two types of numbers on birth certificates. When you were born, the registrar of the county has a registrar has a registrar's file number. That's generally a two to four digit number, and it's usually just the the uh, year that you were born and whatever number of the birth you were in that particular county. Sometimes it's not even that. It's very frequently just a two digit or four digit number. It doesn't have a whole lot of significance. The two digits might be the number for that particular district in the state, and then the other two digits are the birth or the your order of birth for that month or whatever. The real important number on the birth certificate is the state birth number, okay? That's that number up on the side and it'll be like 124-such-such-such-such. This is where I have seen I, more identity changers wind up in the pokey that I'd like to talk about even though they make absolutely wonderful documents. This is the difference between the tech smarts and the street smarts. Let's talk about that numbering system. Once again, this numbering system was created by that vital statistics working group I told you about that meets every 10 years. The first group of three numbers is the first digit of that group of three numbers is always a one. That means the person was born in the United States. I know it seems kind of redundant, but look, that's bureaucrats for you. Okay, I mean, we're talking about American birth certificates, like, well, damn, I guess so. You know, Missouri is in America, but, you know, maybe they figure somebody doesn't know that. In any case, so the first number is always going to be a one. So right there, you go to Miss Snoopy DMV clerk with your Missouri birth certificate, and the first digit is a six on your birth certificate. They know right away, wait a minute, this is baloney. Okay? It's got to be a one if it's a state birth number. Okay. The next two digits are the state number. These are just generally is a goes by alphabetical listing with the exception of Alaska and Hawaii because they came into the union later. So for Missouri, which is the example we're using, that number is 24. Okay? Because if you go through and do alphabetically, Missouri is about the 24th state. Once again, check this out. If you're making a certificate excuse me, that says you were born in Ohio, then get us a real certificate from Ohio and make sure that you get the number right. Because if you go there and your Ohio birth certificate says 150, right away Snoopy Clerk might be, well, wait a minute, I know, I remember from that training film that it said these numbers are in approximately alphabetical order, blah, 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 and there's just no way Ohio does not come before Washington. Okay, know this. Know before you go. Okay, people, this is the whole point. Finally, there's a comma or there's a dash mark. The next two letters, the next two numbers are the year of birth. Of course, now that we're in the new millennium, there may be four because we've got to allow things to roll over. If it's two digits, that's going to be your year of birth in the 1900s. So, somebody born in 1967 in Missouri, the first five digits on their state issue birth certificate. One, born in the United States. 24, born in Missouri. Dash six seven born in 1967. Okay, the last six digits will be the sequential birth number. Now it won't be the exact time you were born in the state, but it will be when they registered you into the central database. Okay, let me explain this. One time when I was doing research to find out on what different states birth certificates look like. I was like, okay, how am I going to find somebody who was born in Georgia or wherever? And then I realized, you know what? Every newspaper covers the first baby born of the year, don't they? And they give the name of the parents and the mother's maiden name because, you know, the baby gets little gifts and whatever. So I went around to all the big city newspapers and I read the story on January 2nd about the first baby born. And that's when I was able then to build up my little file of birth certificates. Well, guess what? The first baby born, for example, in Georgia, in a year I will not disclose, of course, her number, or let's say in Missouri, the first baby born that year, the state birth number would be 124-67-0000000. 
zero, one. The baby who got born after her, zero, 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 two. Okay? You see where I'm going with this? Now, <laughs> oh, shut up. Okay? <laughs> the point of it is, the point of it is, when you're making this number up, if you want to make sure that you don't accidentally make a number that actually could belong to somebody, now this is what I mean by knowing what bureaucrats know and don't know. If I make a number from Missouri and I say, well, I was 124-67-085996, I can tell you something. In Missouri in 1967, there was not 96,026 babies born. But by picking a number that's on that high end of the range, I guarantee that that birth certificate number isn't in any database because it doesn't really exist. But the form of the number is plausible. The form of the number makes sense. You'll have no trouble using putting that birth certificate into using it to get things because in general things are not indexed by a birth certificate number anyway. Yeah, I'll take your question. No, because they won't notice that. What they'll look at is that, okay, this number in sequence makes sense. And then the other thing is, make it so you're born at the end of the year. Number, you're creating the ID. That's up to you. He's asking me, well, wouldn't somebody notice if you were born in January that the number is high? My point of it is, you don't have to necessarily make it you were born in January. I'm using that as an example to let you see that when you make the number up, the form of the number should agree to the form of the number on a real certificate. Just make it so that the, the birth number is high enough that there's no chance in hell that you'll actually cross in a database that you're trying to get into with somebody with the actual number. Now I can tell you as a practical matter, most states do not even put the birth certificate number into the file. They'll usually just check that it was a state birth certificate. Those that do put it in the file, the number is not used as a file identification or retrieval tool. It's usually just entered in as the file, but it's not used to actually segregate, identify, and retrieve the file. The birth certificate number is not used to do that. Yes. No, she's asking me, do they verify the birth certificate with the state of issuance? And this brings me to a point. Government agencies are taught. You go to a DMV office, and that office during the get day's work, they may see as many people that are in this room. They don't have time to verify every birth certificate that's sent in front of them. So the watchwords are, if the documents appear to be authentic and the person presenting them is credible, you accept them. And this is my whole point on understanding how you can use documents to get what you want. Yeah, I'll take your question. I'm about to get to that. Okay, so now we've talked about the numbering sequence. This man's saying, well, what about embossed seals? Once again, this is where so many people in identity changing, they don't do all their homework. It's like they'll go to a DMV with a great-looking birth certificate, and there's no embossed seal. And that looks odd. It's like, well, we know that they always put an embossed seal on it if it's a certified copy. How do I get embossed seals? Well, there's a company called NIC, and they sell state embossers from almost every state. Now, you're wondering, how can they do this? Well, the state seal in most states is in the public domain. There is nothing to prevent all of you, after I'm done talking, from running to Office Max or Staples with a drawing of your state seal and ordering them to make you an embosser with that state seal. In fact, I implore you, go do it right now. Okay? <laughs> so, the point of it is, the state seal is not private property. It belongs to the people. So, you buy an embosser that has the state seal on it. Now, here's where you have to be careful. A birth certificate issued from the State Vital Statistics Bureau will always have the seal of the state on it. 
but a birth certificate that thumbs comes from the county we usually have a county seal in a few cases it may have a county and a state seal but almost always a county issued certificate is going to have the county seal because what does the embossment say the embossment is the certification that it is a accurate and true copy of what is on file that the record is legitimate that's what that embossed seal over the signature usually that's what it actually means that's why everybody wants to see is there an embossed seal now like I said NIC they sell embossers now the government isn't completely stable the passport office they actually look at the seal so if you go to the passport office with a state issued birth certificate but you have a county seal on it then they're going to you're going to get checked out because they look at stuff like that in fact if you look at a US passport application you'll see at the bottom there's little boxes and it says SR CR or city that stands for was it a state registrar vital statistics bureau CR county registrar county statistics bureau or city and then they write down the certificate numbers in general the birth certificate is not verified if everything else is in order however if there are any questions they have authorization to verify so that is the reason like I said agencies operate on the premise that 99.99 percent of the people coming here are honest so if the documents are appear to be authentic or whatever then we give them what they want otherwise the whole system would grind to a halt so that is the thing about certification now understand that there is a difference between document certification and document notarization a notary seal on a document means it is simply a true copy of the original but it does not attest to the accuracy of the information on the document that's why you'll notice places say they want a certified copy not a notarized copy a certified copy says that not only is this a true copy of what's in the record but that the record itself is a legitimate accurate record that's why they want certified copies now you can also buy little things from NIC like a red uh, a red thing that says certified copy red ink is very good because that lets people know that it's not a copy if they see the red ink and I can tell you it makes bureaucrats just their knees wobble you walk in there with a fake birth certificate and it says certified copy and red ink across it they're like oh it must be genuine here okay you can buy a, a stamp that says certified copy from NIC you can also go get one from an office supply store you can buy your own kit and make your own another thing that makes bureaucrats knees wobble is when you get something that says copying prohibited and nice big red letters oh I put one of those on a birth certificate and I think they had an orgasm right there they were like oh yes send this man to the head of the line okay so things like this are important finally you make sure your document doesn't look too good and this is what I'm talking about uh, for example if you make a baptismal certificate when do you get a baptismal certificate you get it when you get baptized most people are baptized at usually a young age so if I walk into a, a DMV office that, and I'm saying I'm 30 and I'm like well here's my baptismal certificate and it looks like it came out yesterday but I was supposed to have gotten it back in 1970 I guarantee you there's some questions that are going to be asked especially if there's a little copyright notice on it that says copyright 1985 on the sheet in other words a baptismal certificate should be old crumply it should look like it's been around I talk about in many of my books on new ID and the ID forger and some of the others out there how to age documents using such common household items as iced tea and coffee and you can age documents very very well a documents age should all should always look appropriate for its age a birth certificate that you supposedly got back in 1970 should not look like you got it yesterday 
okay? Other thing, learn to keep things like date stampers, because of course now we're in the year 2000. Those date stampers you have from 1990, 91, 88 can be very useful because it can allow you to stamp an old date on a document. Remember things like that, okay? These are all very important things, okay? So uh, basically, I will tell you, this book covers how to make these documents. Because there's two ways to forge. There's the old-fashioned way using whiteout, photocopies, light table, paste up. I cover that. I also cover things on forging. For example, if your scanner can only scan at 300 dpi, it doesn't matter that you've got a 1200 by 1200 dpi printer because you can't print what ain't on the image. So I talk about stuff like this, that when you have to need a high-res scanner, you also want a very high resolution printer. I talk about the minimum system requirements. Now remember, this book, you know, a year ago I did the research, so of course technology has sped up. But the, com the parts about computer forgery on birth certificates and such is written at a level that if you just have rudimentary computer knowledge, as you guys know I do, you can read this and then go out and buy the things and then start turning out good copies. The thing of it is is that if you can make good foundation documents, birth certificates, college transcripts, uh, even things like social security cards, whatever, you can penetrate the identification system and you can get almost any real document that you want to get. And that's what I want to want to, to touch on. And uh, this is an excellent guide to doing that. Before I take questions and then go, the other thing that I wanted to ask you is that, look, I have a sign-up sheet for the book I mentioned yesterday, if you sign up with your name and email, when it comes out, you get 20% off. I also would like it if there's somebody here uh, from uh, in the military who would not mind me having a, making a copy of a mili current military or dependent ID. No, 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 listen. Listen, listen, you guys. Hey, hey, hang on, hang on, listen. You guys have dealt with me long enough to know that you want two things. Unless you tell me you're going to blow up a building or commit mass murder, anything you say to me or give to me stays with me. I'm trying to build up a database on different identity documents and birth certificates. Anybody who helps me on that, I guarantee you two things. You'll get your document back because all I want to do is scan it, wipe the data off of it, and then you'll have your document back. If you're not comfortable with uh, doing that here, uh, drop me an email, and I'll be more than willing to make it with you while in the form of a book or a free consult on something, that kind of thing. The other thing is, once again, I'm looking for an expert on internet privacy. I'm, I'm willing to work with more than one person on, for different aspects of that chapter. In any case, I'll take some questions and then until the goons run me off.